Hello and welcome to the latest in our series of webcasts ahead of next year's Scottish independence referendum. This time we're looking at the economy. I'll be putting your questions to Robin McAlpine, director of the Jimmy Reid Foundation, and Professor John Struthers from the University of the West of Scotland. Joining us from our studios in Edinburgh, we have Ben Thompson, chairman of Reform Scotland, and Professor Mike Danson from Heriot Watt University. Welcome to you all. Let's go straight into it with a, a question from Bruce who says, in the interests of balance throughout the debate, uh, can these experts on the economy declare which side of the referendum debate they personally come from? Shall we rattle through it, Robin? I take it you're for independence? Yes, um, the, the Reid Foundation is trying to maintain neutrality and enable space for everyone else to come in, but I personally support independence. John? Yes, I, I'm against independence. Uh, and always have been? Um, well, especially since the debate started in the last few years. I mean, I think previous decades I might have been in a supporter. That might come up in some of right. the questions later. Well, actually. we'll see. <laughs> uh, and Ben Thompson, uh, Reform Scotland's very much in favour of Devo Plus. Does that mean you want to keep the union but change it? Exactly that. I mean, we're in the middle and, uh, and frankly, whichever side gets to the middle first would have my vote, which is um, to have a strong union with the rest of the United Kingdom, but to see fiscal powers and more welfare come down to, uh, to Holyrood. Right. And Mike Danson? Yes, I'm, I'm in favour of independence. OK. Well, that being said, and out of the way, let's uh, kick off with a question from David Miller, um, who says countries such as Luxembourg, Cyprus, Croatia and Slovenia have populations much less than Scotland. Are there any real economic hindrances to these countries? And what economic model would best suit an independent Scotland in terms of international comparisons? John Struthers, these are small countries. They seem to be able to function quite well. I don't think they're good comparators for an independent Scotland. Um, the countries you've mentioned are quite diverse. Um, Luxembourg, uh, you mentioned Cyprus, I think, and is Estonia. Luxembourg, Cyprus, Cyprus, Cyprus Croatia, Croatia, and Slovenia. And this question, These are all yeah. diverse economies, uh, have different strengths and weaknesses. To compare those with a potential independent Scotland would be a false comparison. Is ours not a diverse economy? Well, what I'm saying, they're different between, each, between other. each other. Yes, okay. that, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. Right. I mean, I don't think you could compare the Scottish economy, for example, to the Luxembourg economy. And indeed, whether you would even want to. Is, is the point about this that the, there's a range of different economies with different uh, skills in them, different strengths, and yet they all seem to thrive? Yes, I mean, it is, it is possible for um, countries to thrive, even if they're small. Um, and as long as they have something to offer to the world economy that is distinctive and uh, presumably each of these countries do. Mike Danson, from your point of view, the, the other part of this question is to say which ec or what economic model would best suit an independent Scotland. So you say Scotland could thrive, but which of the foreign comparators would you look to? They, well, I have looked at in some detail the Nordic countries, which again are diverse and so on, um, but they start off with an awful lot of similarities to Scotland in terms of size, in terms of economic development. And they've shown very strongly that they, uh, they performed very well. They lead on almost every league table we can think of in terms of economics, of health, the well-being, of standards of living and so forth. Iceland didn't do very well in the crash. It, it didn't do well in the crash, but hey, is it rebounded? And by next year, Iceland will have a lower debt per head, public debt per head, than the UK will. OK, Robin McAlpine, your model, I suspect, will be much more about social justice and, uh, and equality. But is there a particular country that you would look to? Well, what we've been doing at the Reed Foundation with the Commonwealth Project is to say the aim is not to make a facsimile of an existing country. You can't become something which developed over 30 years in a different context. But to look at the countries that have been successful and to identify what things they did that helped them to be successful. And when you come to look at that, the Nordic countries have so many of the success stories that you're going to be looking there. But to, to say that, it, that you're separating the economy and the society question, I think has been one of the big mistakes. A lot of the problems that we have with our, econo with our society is because of the economy and the structure of that economy. And what we're trying to do is to say that we've got to start seeing economic policy and social policy as one coordinated way to say, identify what kind of country do you want to live in and how do you develop it. So, the so you get the society first and then 
make the economy fitter? No, neither. The, these things are hand in hand. We, what we're saying is we need a process of social and economic development, mm -hmm. which is moving both of these policy areas to, forward together in a way which reinforces each other. If we want strong public finances, we need a high pay economy, for example. So ensuring that we've got a productive economy with high paying jobs is how we create the wealth in people's pockets, which means that tax revenues can afford the public services they need. So it's a, it's a, connected, um, it's a okay. connected model. Well, we'll go on to tax in, in a minute, but Ben, Thompson from Reform, and Reform is sometimes described as a centre-right think tank, I know you might not like that description, but um, presumably your models would not be these uh, social welfare models of the Nordic countries. Uh, I think there are bits of the Nordic countries that are actually uh, very healthy, and I think I agree with the other panellists that there's no single country you could identify. You want to take the best bits of, of different countries, and um, I think Scotland could use a number of different models and it could certainly be viable as an independent country. Um, the Nordic models are quite interesting. They have a much higher public sector expenditure in, in the Nordic countries. But then people sometimes also overlook that uh, a lot of the public sector expenditure is provided by the private sector and they're much more local. Uh, they're much more towards localism than we are in, in, uh, in the United Kingdom. So there are th aspects of the Nordic countries that uh, are a little bit different than sometimes they're portrayed and are worth looking at. There are some very interesting examples of how public sector is run in Denmark and in, uh, and in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, particularly around sort of schools and, and health systems. So I think um, you can take, whether it's the UK or Scotland, examples from other countries and use them quite effectively, but always understanding that you know, we are different in the Scotland and the UK, so there's no particular model that's going to exactly fit. Here's a question from Ian Law, uh, and maybe Ben Thompson, you'd like to address this one. If Scotland needed to borrow, what credit rating could this new nation expect to have? It's interesting, isn't it? Because credit ratings <coughs> are based on what you've done in the past. Scotland would have no history, would it? It'd be quite difficult to run a, a deficit uh, if people had no idea of what your credit rating might be. Uh, initially, it, it, its credit rating will be under review, and that will mean that the cost of money will be higher. Over time, when it establishes itself with the credit rating agencies and with borrowers, then the strength of its credit rating will depend on the viability of its, of its economy and how its public sector uh, economy is run. So um, it, it will take some time, there will be a period of uncertainty. Mike of course, just, just to follow yeah. on on that, is that what the White Paper next week will probably say is that Scotland will be part of a monetary union in which case as part of monetary union we'll actually have to work out whether it's going to be Scotland that's going to do the borrowing or whether it's the Bank of England and Scotland stands behind its debt which may be slightly different. Okay well we'll get on to monetary issues and, and the currency and, and which currency it should be in a little while but, but Mike Danson on this business of if there were to be independence, uh, sudden independence as it were with uh, Scotland a new nation wanting to run uh, a deficit how would it be able to borrow without a credit history? In, in the same way that any individual when they, they first borrow uh, will, will be given a, an offer at different interest rates. I uh, agree with Ben and other economists then we could expect initially um, to have a higher cost of money. That wouldn't be prohibitively high given our assets and so forth. Um, but we might well expect the markets to take a while to, to come to terms with Scottish independence. But the independence process will not be overnight, it won't be sudden, it'll be over several months, if not two years, I think is the plan. Well, Bill Colley, uh, one of our viewers, uh, raises this point of, of uh, splitting not just uh, the income, as it were, uh, of the UK, but also um, the assets and the debt. Uh, and he says, um, if uh, S Scotland uh, were to make a an assets grab, he says, of £10 billion, um, wouldn't the um, debt also have to be split? And is, is that something, John Struthers, that you think uh, <coughs> would be difficult to do? I mean, there would be a lot of negotiations to do there. Yes. I mean, if we were to view an independent Scotland like a company uh, and we were to treat it like a balance sheet, there are assets and liabilities. And certainly an independent Scotland could have very large uh, value of assets, including North Sea Oil and other human capital assets. There's no question about that. But, but we shouldn't discount the initial value of the 
potential transfer of debt. The Institute of Fiscal Studies has recently estimated in a very recent paper that's actually going to be presented next Monday in Edinburgh at the David Hume Institute that the debt to GDP ratio of an, of an independent Scotland, even factoring in the uh, oil revenues, would could be as high as two-thirds of GDP. Now that's actually lower than the current UK debt. And it's enough. a lot lower than countries like Japan. It is a lot lower, but we would be starting off with that. And, you know, it, it does actually re relate to the credit ratings issue. Um, if we get off to a bad start with the credit rating agencies, like any individual, it's quite difficult to recover your credit rating. Uh, from a poor start, and that would, that, would, that would also happen to an independent country. Robin McAlpin, let me put this point to you from um, Raymond Kerr, who, who says, given the cyclical nature of economies, how resilient would an independent Scotland be? We talked about Iceland there, that, a small country that took a big hit, so did Ireland. Is Scotland big enough? Oh, it's certainly big enough. That's not really the question. The question is, do we have an economy that can survive the cyclical shocks? Um, and we've got to start by answering that question to look at the economy we're in. Um, I've talked to a lot of senior f people in finance and economics and if you seek out views on just how likely it is that the UK is going to get through the next decade or 15 years without another major financial shock or another major economic problem um, and you're finding people saying they don't think this is likely, you're not talking to the same people I am because what they're really saying is the City of London hasn't reformed. It's uh, uh, After the last crash, the problems haven't gone away. So um, in the economy that we're in just now, my estimation is that we face a serious problem because we are massively over-reliant on the City of London, the city of London is very volatile. The key, and one of the key reasons why I support independence, the key is to develop an economy which isn't over-reliant on one industry sector. Now that's the opportunity for Scotland, that's what we've got to do. We, it's, it's crazy to project five or ten years into the future and imagine that an independent Scotland has just stayed exactly static, like it is just now. The key is we need a productive manufacturing industry in Scotland and that is what will give you good credit ratings and that is what will give you the strong public finances and the, and the confidence. We're not getting that in the UK. Would manufacturing industry be nationalised? Would, would this be promoted by the government in some way or subsidised? We need a national industrial policy. The, 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 the key, the, the question you asked earlier on about what economic model, the economic model that hasn't worked for Scotland is an entirely laissez-faire one, whereby you say we're just going to take as much regulation as way as possible. Well, central planning didn't work either, did well, it? Well, central though, planning for, did work. It didn't work for Corpac, it didn't work for it's, Invergordon. In the, period when, in the period when we had an industrial policy in the UK between about 45 and about 75, we saw the best changes in all the economic indicators in Scotland. And likewise, if you look again at the Nordic countries, where they take a very a more interventionist model where they have universities and government agencies and different players in the economy working in a collegiate way to manage decisions, to manage um, the progress of the economy as a whole, you get massively better outcomes. Um, so what didn't work was when we took all of that away and said whoever is the biggest and the strongest can just shove everyone else out the road and we will have an economy which is dominated by the big players. That hasn't worked. Okay, well let me move on to <coughs> fiscal matters, maybe tax uh, and so on. Ian Hunter uh, writes to say, given Scotland's ageing population, what are the chances of income tax being increased to make up any budget shortfall? Well, John Struthers, this gets us to the heart of how much would we be taxed, mm -hmm. how much public spending would there be? Mm -hmm. uh, would we be poorer in an independent Scotland? To me, this is right at the heart of the debate in terms of the future for an independent Scotland. Uh, I've not seen any statement, clear-cut statement, by any of the, the protagonists for, for Scottish independence as to what tax regime they will adopt. I know the white paper is about to come out. The Fiscal Commission that, that was established by the Scottish Government d has laid out certain options, but it, it does tie into the current issue as well because one of the um, falsehoods, I think, that is being put out is that if we retain sterling or become part of the sterling zone, we will not have fiscal independence. We'd be able to tax in any way we want. We could drop corporation tax, increase income tax, change all the thresholds, couldn't we? Well, let's look at that issue. Um, whenever you have a monetary union or a currency union, over time, stresses and strains lead to the creation of fiscal union. There are examples in history where that hasn't happened. Well, it hasn't happened I, I with the euro yet. Uh, well, the euro is not a particularly good example for us to, to, to go on, and that's precisely the point, that an independent Scotland would have to, in some shape or form, sign a fiscal pact 
with the rest of the United Kingdom. What, to promise what? Not to put up taxes or not to have well, lower I mean, taxes I, than the remainder of the UK? There would have to be a commitment to uh, adjust your taxes that are not just to, in the interest of the Scottish economy, but, but are not out of kilter with the rest of the United Kingdom economy. OK, Mike Danson, is it possible even to have fiscal independence? Yeah, no country has total fiscal independence anywhere in the world because we have a global economy. Um, I think John's wrong in a number of aspects to what he's just said. Um, the, at the moment we have no control over monetary policy nor fiscal policy. There are a number of um, reports out, he said, the Merleys Commission, the Fiscal Commission and so on, which say we need radical reform of our tax and welfare system in various ways. One element of that, looking forward in Scotland, should be a land value tax, a uh, tax based on immovable assets. Uh, the other aspect of all this is it would be up to negotiation. It would not be a client state, we would not be a dependency uh, state of the rest of the UK, it would be looking at what is good for the whole of the UK as two separate entities. Um, so I think that, that there are very positive reasons for looking forward and saying that we could um, structure our tax and benefit system in a much more different, better performing, um, more equitable way than we do at the moment. And well, various governments have said that. Ben Thompson, your idea of Devo Plus, it, this is in the event of a no vote, but with more powers for Holyrood. To what extent would that allow a Scottish government to impose its own tax regime and perhaps undercut the rest of the UK? Well, there is already tax differences across different parts of the United Kingdom. So tax competition, as you will, is already with us in, in, uh, in different business rates from England to, to Scotland, for instance. But I mean, I think the, the, at the heart of the problem here is that over 90%, probably 94% of all taxation is raised by Westminster. But 60% of the expenditure is done at a devolved government or a local government level across the UK. That's not just Scotland, that's a problem right the way across the United Kingdom. And if you compare that to other places around the world, you know, there are places like Switzerland or America or Canada or Australia, um, the majority of uh, local spending is, is covered by local tax raising. So actually people become much more engaged if they have to raise the taxes that they spend rather than have them raised centrally and rely on some sort of budget which doesn't make local politicians or devolved politicians at Holyrood really accountable for the money that they spend. Is that why they've not changed the income tax which they're allowed to, which they could do under devolution? Yeah, at the moment we have 3p that's now under the Scotland Act going up to 10p worth of change on income tax. But it's an incredibly blunt tool. You'd never use just income tax. The whole point of using local tax is to have a range. So Scotland's big uh, industries are tourism and oil and renewables and, uh, and finance, uh, manufacturing technology. Um, you can use different taxes to suit the industries, the local industries that are here in Scotland. So we, I mean, the South East is very preoccupied by non-DOM taxes for foreign visitors. I mean, really, that really isn't an issue much in Scotland. So there are certain taxes that are actually very vital for developing our economy and also because our society is different from the society down in the South East, so that we can do things in a way that suits Scotland. We don't need independence for that. We can get it under independence. But actually, if we just evolve much greater tax powers, as they do, and I slightly disagree with John on this, um, a large number of countries around the rest of the world devolve much greater tax powers at a devolved or local level under a federal system. And that does make local politicians more accountable and it makes people in their areas feel that they're much more closer to the decisions that are made over how much one should spend on public services compared to how much is raised in tax from them. Well, Robin McAlpin, the, a point that uh, Dr Craig DL of Lanarkshire makes in a, in a question that he puts to us is to say that uh, there was recently a report which uh, revealed that VAT paid on goods bought in Scottish stores, like big supermarkets, doesn't appear on Scotland's accounts books. And how many other hidden uh, sources of income uh, could accrue to Scotland uh, on independence. I think what he's getting at there is that actually you can't always get all the money that's generated in a country like Scotland because a lot of the companies and uh, retail companies and so on are, are multinational and, and all the money may be somewhere else. That's a choice 
That's a choice the UK state makes. The UK state has one of the laxest tax regimes of all the advanced large economies in the world. Um, the policy is written by secondees from the tax avoidance industry who go in and make the most complex tax code of any of the countries that I'm aware of. It is easy to fix these things. And should one, we simplify the tax code? We should flat tax? Be, no, no, no. Simplify the, 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 the flat tax. We just need to simplify the ways in which you collect it. Now, I'll give you one simple example. It is entirely legal to tax a corporation on the proportion of its total sales globally which take place in your country. So if a corporation has a global turnover of X and say 3% of its global sales take place in Scotland, you can just tax on 3% of its global turnover. It is unavoidable and there is nothing that can be done about that. This is one of the problems with this whole debate is we're looking out from the UK. The UK is phenomenally bad at this. We are a terrible country at collecting our taxes. And the idea that you cannot do anything about these things, this argument that we're in a global world so there's nothing we can do is absolute garbage. Everybody else does this better than us. Most other countries are better at collecting their tax. We absolutely can do better. But isn't it the case that some American corporations, for instance, have an office in, in Ireland and, and a lot of the profits are deemed to come through that, for yeah. instance, just as an example of, of And of all that. you do is you say, fine, but your global turnover is X, your sales in country is Y, so we're taking Y percentage of X. That's the whole point. Transfer pricing is fine if you use the kind of models that we... Uh, if somebody's ordering goods and services on the internet from a company in, say, Luxembourg, um, and they are delivered somewhere else. How will Scotland as a, as a nation be able to say, well, I need some of your money? How it's are they going to enforce that? It's, 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 again, it's entirely legal. If you're buying something which is delivered to an address in Scotland from a Scottish account, that's an in-sale country. You can simply say, what is your books? How many in-country sales did you make? In Scotland, fine, we now know what your sales in that country were. We can tax your global corporate profits on that basis. I mean, I, I tend to agree with Robin on that point, actually. Um, however, um, we don't have what, what he's recommending, I think, whether it, in an independent Scotland or not, which would be a, what we'd call a turnover tax rather than a profits tax. Mm -hmm. And I think you're absolutely right on that. But that's not the question that we're addressing no. here. The, 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 the question that you asked is regarding, you know, a, a tax like VAT. Um, it's, it's quite interesting that the, the Devil Plus proposals, which I've got some degree of sympathy for, by the way, Ben, actually, because I, I think um, as a halfway house, if you like, between what we have at the moment and full independence, because what, what they're recommending is a greater control over income tax, a c corporation tax, um, but VAT and national insurance and those type of taxes would, would remain at, at Westminster. To me, uh, that, that is a, a more palatable, if you like, uh, uh, way forward for Scotland. I'm not against more tax raising powers for Scotland, just to be clear on that point. But those indirect taxes are kind of regressive, aren't they? You, you'd be much more progressive to have income based taxes or, or, or taxes based on, say, land value. Well, in the Scotland Act, the, fac the facility is already there for that, for that to happen. Ben referred to the possibility that um, uh, under the Scotland Act, this is without independence, we Scot in Scotland would have the freedom to vary our tax uh, down by 10p in the, in the pound. Um, we'd lose the block grant element of that, uh, of that uh, but raise, raise the tax to any level we want and keep the difference in revenue that we would gain from that. That, that would be quite easy to introduce uh, because one of the things we have to remember about taxation and Robin's right about how complex our tax system in the, is in this country. And whether in an independent Scotland or not, we need to simplify it. But, but our, the ta taxes and changing tax regimes is a, a very complex uh, procedure. Okay. Well, let me move on to the subject of currency and, and monetary issues and, and the whole business of post-independence, um, what currency we would use. Here's uh, Doug Kennedy who says, if the pound is kept, will the Bank of England control the currency and interest rates? Mike Danson, that is a problem, isn't it? Uh, at the moment, the proposal is to keep the pound. In the past, it was to use the euro, but in any event, it does look as if uh, post-independence for the, the medium term, it would be the pound. That would give us severely restricted powers, wouldn't it? Well, I didn't understand that's the SNP government's view. Sure. Um, others have a different view. I think inevitably we'll, we'll have a period of retaining sterling um, where we have very little control at the moment. Um, in fact, it's not very good for any part of the UK outside of London's South East, the way that monetary supply and um, monetary policy is run in this country. It's to the benefit of the City of London, which doesn't even benefit the citizens of London. So, 
in some ways we, we'd be no worse off than they are currently. In the longer term then we have other options and for, for many of us the whole point of independence is to have a stronger economy, a fairer economy and so forth. In which well, case when, would, when would you advocate moving away from the pound, say to the euro or to an independent Scottish currency? When, when it's suitable and appropriate so to do. Um, when what, five years, ten years? Uh, I, I would expect five years or so, yes. We, and, and it'll depend on what's happening elsewhere in the UK. Uh, Robin said earlier, you know, we can expect another financial crisis, banking crisis in the UK, because nothing has changed. We need banking and regulatory reform. Um, that isn't happening in the UK, so we don't know what happened elsewhere. Uh, there's also changes in the Eurozone, etc. Do you think we would ever join the Euro? Would that be your favourite favoured currency? Um, the, there are pros and cons of all these currency arrangements. I must say, I don't get overly excited about any of them, because I think it's about the underlying strength structure of your economy, rather than about any particular um, um, currency you're in. It's right. interesting, the Nordic countries, some are in the EU, some aren't, some are in the Euro, some aren't, and they're all performing very well over the period since 2008-2009. Ben Thompson, where, where do you stand on this whole currency issue? <coughs> Well, I mean, I think one has to work with, with what has been said so far, which is under independence, we would be looking to have monetary union. Now, let's, you know, let's just look at what that would mean. After a vote for independence, we'd have to sit down as two sovereign states to knock out a treaty, a sort of Maastricht-like treaty, um, which slightly fills me with dread at the thought of civil servants um, knocking out these treaties, but it will have to incorporate... Um, how the monetary policy at the Bank of England is going to work on setting interest rates, um, how we do quantitative easing and printing of money, um, who is the borrower of last resort, how financial stability in the system is controlled by the Bank of England. And once you start going down that route, you then also have to look at something which John mentioned earlier, which is uh, controls on deficit and, uh, and public sector deficit, trade deficits, and, uh, and also there'll be some degree of tax harmonisation because, uh, uh, um, you know, running a, a single currency, as Europe has shown us, needs a, a level of harmonisation. And all of that will have to come under a treaty with all its bureaucracies and, uh, and, uh, and when changes happen, then there'll have to be a process. Yeah. Well, Robin, now, there's no, way yeah. that the English, that there's no way that the rest of the UK is going to sign up to a treaty that says this only lasts five years and go through all the hassle for that. It's going to be, like Maastricht, an undefined length of term, but and the expectation on on. is well, it's going to go on for a considerable length of time. Uh, Callum Crichton writes, uh, Roman McAlpin, uh, how much independence could Scotland reasonably expect if it retains sterling as its currency? Well, more than we've got just now. I mean, the, one of the things that I find quite farcical about this is when people say, and where would be the democratic control in Scotland over sterling? Where's our democratic control over sterling just well, now? Well, because the we debates. send MPs to the... House of Commons. We, yeah. we devolved the, the Monetary Policy Committee. It's independent. It's not a democratic body. They can set their interest rates according to the loosest guidance from the Chancellor as possible. All the things that Ben just discussed there, he made it sound like it's a bad thing. Oh, we'll have to discuss all these crucial issues. Hooray! Let's get out and have a discussion about all these questions rather than having it um, sorted out by a group of people in the City of London to their own terms. Sterling is a badly run currency for industry. It's run for finance, not for industry. And the simple, que the, the simple question that people keep asking is, what do you think will happen with currency? And I say, I'm not going to say what I think should happen. I will predict strongly that we will have a five-year currency reunion. And at the end of the, by that point, Scotland is going to notice that sterling is not a good currency for it. And we will make a collective decision to do something else. John so Southers, I, I, know, I know you don't <laughs> want independence, but if it should come, what do you think Scotland should do? In terms Pound of the currency? While? In terms of the currency? Yeah. Uh, sterling is the least bad option. There are only three possibilities, sterling, the euro, or to create your own currency. We could go into technical details about hybrids, but f as Ben has said, uh, I mean, I couldn't uh, agree more uh, with Ben. He has summed it up perfectly that uh, it, this is not a trivial issue. We are a full member of an existing monetary union at the moment. Now, whether you like sterling or not, or whether it's for the southeast of England, all these arguments are put out all the time. That is what we have. If we become independent and retain sterling, we would at best become an associate member 
of that of that arrangement okay. and then we'd have to negotiate all the things that Ben has has identified that cannot be trivialized it's a uh, it's really at the heart of the matter in terms of the currency okay well thanks very much uh, for that I'm afraid that's all we have time for uh, Professor John Struthers Robin McAlpine Ben Thompson and Professor Mike Danson uh, thank you all very much thank you and thank you for joining us and for more on the independence debate including background analysis and the latest developments in the story, go to the BBC Scotland News website and click on Scotland's Future. Bye.